Axial muscles are muscles that have both their origin and insertion on the axial skeleton. And they can typically be arranged into five different groups. Muscles of the head and neck are used for facial expression, chewing, and swallowing. Muscles of the vertebral column support the head and the spinal column. Muscles of respiration aid in breathing. And muscles of the abdominal wall and muscles of the pelvic floor help to support and protect the abdominal and pelvic organs, respectively. We're eventually going to get to all five of these in this course, but today we're going to be focusing on the first two, muscles of the head and neck and muscles of the vertebral column. The erector spinae muscles help to maintain posture, extend the neck and trunk, and also rotate the head, and they're organized into three groups that run parallel with the vertebral column. The iliocostalis is the most lateral group, the longissimus is the middle group, and the spinalis is the most medial group that inserts into the spinous processes of the vertebrae. One mnemonic for helping to remember these three groups of muscles is I love spaghetti, ILS, and you can remember that the S is closest to the spine because it's called the spinalis. This is just giving you another view of where these are located. This is the posterior view of a cadaver that's had some of the more superficial muscles removed, and you can see the iliocostalis here, the longissimus, and then the spimalis. And this is one of our models from the lab classroom. And again, you can see all three of them here, the iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. The other axial muscles that I want to talk about today are some of the posterior neck muscles. These posterior neck muscles, or the splenius muscles, will extend the neck when they are contracting bilaterally, or rotate the head if they're contracting unilaterally. Two groups of muscles here, we've got the splenius capitis and splenius cervicis. The cervicis is referring to cervical or the neck region, capitis, cap meaning to the head. There's two distinct groups of them in this image from your textbook. Uh, if you were to look at an actual cadaver, this is showing approximately where the, this is identifying the, the two muscles for you, but as you can see, it's a little bit of a gradient when you make the transition from one to the other, and it's not always incredibly obvious. On our two models that we have in the lab, on one of them, if you were to look at the, the key of that model, it's just identifying this as being both of them. It doesn't distinguish between the two. And on one of the charts that we have, on one side, again, it just refers to this as being the splenius capitis and cervicis, while on the other side, on the left side, it is identifying it just as the splenius capitis because the trapezius is still there, and it would be covering up any portion of this that would be classified as part of the splenius cervicis. In contrast to the axial muscles, the appendicular muscles in, as a whole control the movement of the upper limbs and the lower limbs. They stabilize and control the movements of the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdles. They're organized into groups based on their location in the body or the part of the skeleton that they move. And they work in groups that are either synergistic or antagonistic. And it's these latter two components that I really want you to focus on as we're covering these muscles. Because if you can focus on the bigger picture and understand why a muscle does what it does based on where it's located, that's going to help you out a lot more than if you're just um, trying to memorize charts of origins, insertions, and actions. So what about then the muscles of the pectoral girdle and the muscles of the upper limb? These are also organized into five different groups. We have the muscles that move the pectoral girdle, muscles that move the glenohumeral joint, arm and forearm muscles that move the elbow joint or forearm, the forearm muscles that move the wrist joint, the hand and the fingers, and then finally the intrinsic muscles of the hand. This latter one is a class that we are not going to cover in this course, even though it does touch on it in your textbook. If you haven't yet watched the videos that are associated with lab lessons 13, 15, and 16, so the axial muscles, the muscles of the upper arm, and the muscles of the forearm, I'm going to recommend that you pause this video and go back and watch those first because those videos are really going to be focusing on the identification of these different muscles. In this activity that's coming up, I'm gonna be focusing more on the actions of the muscles relative to their locations. So it's gonna be a little bit easier if you already are able to identify these muscles. If you go onto our class page, you should be able to find the documents that are associated with this activity. It should be a four-page document. The first two pages are a set of instructions that are going through all of the different upper limb muscle actions 
and asking you to color code some of these muscles based on what those actions are. And keep in mind that you don't want to color it in completely solid because if a muscle has multiple actions, you're going to need to have multiple colors associated with it. And then you also have another sheet of two pages of uh, figures to color. The ones that you can see here on the left are from your textbook. The ones on the right are actually clips of one of the charts that we have in the classroom. It's one that students often have a difficult time with when it comes to identifying the arm muscles. So let's go ahead and start with that movement of the pectoral girdle. As you know from our talk on articulations, the pectoral girdle can be retracted and protracted, and it can be elevated and depressed. And so I want you to think now about where those muscles would have to be located in order to achieve that action. Let's go ahead and start with the elevation and the depression. If you have a muscle that is going to be responsible for elevating the scapula when it contracts, keeping in mind that when a muscle contracts, the insertion is going to move towards the origin where does that origin have to be relative to the scapula? And I imagine you should be able to answer that by saying, okay, that origin is going to be superior so that if it inserts onto the scapula, it's going to pull it up. Uh, likewise, then, if it is something, if it is a muscle that is going to depress the pectoral girdle, then it is going to be inferior to the scapula. Protraction and retraction, you can use the same kind of logic there. If it is a retractor, it'll be on the posterior part of the body, and if it's a protractor, it should be on the anterior part. So now let's go back to the instructions that are on your activity page, and we're going to do section A together, looking at the scapula, and then I'll let you um, have a little more independence as we move on to the next parts of it. So the first part is asking you to color in the two muscles you're responsible for that elevate the scapula, and we're going to be coloring those brown. And hopefully you're familiar, um, whether you're having to look it up or just use some logic right now, that's fine, but you'll recognize that uh, the trapezius, and specifically the superior fibers of the trapezius, are assisting with the scapular elevation, as well as the appropriately named levator scapulae. So both of those are the two elevators that we're talking about, and you can see how both of these muscles have insertions on the scapula, but their origins are going to be superior to the scapula, and that's how they're going to be able to elevate this. Um, as far as depression, you'll notice that there isn't any, uh, there, there aren't any instructions to color in a muscle responsible for depression because there's only one that you're responsible for, and it's very tiny in these figures to begin with, but that is the subclavius. Uh, just don't forget about that one, uh, however, you know, make sure you're still comfortable identifying that one on any of the charts and models in the lab. The next step moves on to scapula retractors and protractors. So it asks you to identify the three muscles that retract the scapula and also the two muscles that protract the scapula. If we're looking at retractions, we already mentioned just a few minutes ago that we should be looking at the posterior side for those muscles, hence our first starting view here. And we have the middle fibers of the trapezius, as well as the two rhomboids, the rhomboid minor and the rhomboid major. On the right here, I have an image pointing out the ligamentum nuchae, which should sound familiar to you. We've talked about this recently. Um, so recall that this is a large median ligament that's composed of tendons and fascia that's located right in between the posterior muscles of the neck. And it covers the spines of C1 through C6. It is a superior and posterior extension of the supraspinous ligament. The ligamentum nuchae is one of the origins of the trapezius, in addition to the occipital bone and the spinous processes of C7 through T12. And then underneath the trapezius, where you've, you're going to find the two rhomboids, and those are originating from the spinous processes of C7 through T1 for the minor, and T2 through T5 for the rhomboid major. What about our protractors? Your instructions are asking you to color the two muscles that protract the scapula in dark blue. We have the serratus anterior, which we can see from both the posterior and the anterior views, and then the pectoralis minor. So now let's go ahead and try to complete all of the rest of our sketches here. So we're going to add in our middle trapezius fibers, our rhomboid major and minors, our pectoralis minor, and the serratus anterior from both perspectives. So now we've completed the coloration of the instructions um, for part A there. And hopefully again, you're seeing this pattern. You're seeing that our brown fibers, our scapular elevators, are located posteriorly and superiorly. All of these retractors in orange are posteriorly and they're all originating from some point along the vertebral column. And then these protractors are going to be uh, along the 
lateral edge and wrapping around to the anterior side. Section B addresses the shoulder joint. And the first question it asks is what is the anatomical name of this joint? And that is the glenohumeral joint. We've already mentioned that this is a synovial ball and socket. And so very similar to the coxal joint, it is able to facilitate flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, and medial and lateral rotation. Steps one through six under this section is asking you to identify the muscles that are contributing to these processes. And it even goes so far as to tell you exactly how many muscles you should be doing for that. So go ahead and pause this video now and try to complete section B. And then we're going to go through those muscles and make sure that you've identified them correctly. All right, so as I said, we're gonna go through these answers kind of quickly because hopefully this is just a review of what you've already completed in your activity. Muscles that flex the shoulder. Your activity asked you to find the three muscles that flex the shoulder and to color them red. So hopefully you took care of the deltoid and specifically the anterior fibers of the deltoid because there are three sets of fibers, anterior, lateral, and posterior, pectoralis major, and the coracobrachialis. All of these are located on the anterior side and all of them insert into the humerus. Muscles that extend the shoulder also insert into the humerus, but these are going to be located on the posterior side of the, of the body. We have more deltoids, but this time the posterior fibers. There is the teres major, and then the latissimus dorsi. I want you to think about the latissimus dorsi and the teres major as being kind of a paired set of muscles. Each one of them has three actions, and both of them have the same three actions. So if you know what one of them does, you're going to know what the other one does as well. Muscles that abduct the shoulder are going to be located on the lateral side and also um, insert onto the humerus. We have the supraspinatus, which is the first of the rotator cuff muscles that we're gonna be mentioning, supraspinatus above the spine, and then the lateral fibers of the deltoid. and muscles that adduct the shoulder. These are going to be located on the medial side, but they're going to be on both the posterior and the anterior part of the body. There are several large muscles that assist in shoulder adduction. This includes the pectoralis major and the coracobrachialis, which we've already mentioned as shoulder flexors, and then the teres major and the latissimus dorsi, which we've already mentioned as shoulder extenders. So these are cases where some of these muscles are, um, can be both synergists and antagonists to each other. So the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi are antagonists when it comes to flexion and extension, but they're synergists when it comes to shoulder adduction. Medial rotation, these are muscles that are going to insert onto the anterior part of the humerus. So you can imagine how all of these have their insertions here on that anterior edge of the humerus. And so when this muscle contracts, it's going to take this humerus and rotate it medially. The subscapularis is another one of the rotator cuff muscles that is going to assist with that. The teres major, which we've already talked about, and the latissimus dorsi, which we've already talked about. So this is the third action that both of those muscles are contributing to. Um, also the pectoralis major, I've just removed that one from this image because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything else. So this is another case where the pectoralis major is sharing some actions with the latissimus dorsi and teres major as well. And how about muscles that laterally rotate the humerus? These are going to insert onto the posterior or lateral part of the humerus. And so we're looking at the posterior side right now and we're able to see the last of the rotator cuff, the last two of the rotator cuff muscles, the infraspinatus below the spine, and then the teres minor. Um, in addition, the posterior deltoid fibers assist with that lateral rotation and I've just made them somewhat translucent here so you could see through them better. So we've identified several of these rotator cuff muscles already. There are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis, and I've color-coded them based on the actions in your activity sheet. So again, just as a quick review, the supraspinatus is going to be above the spine, and it is initiating abduction of the arm. It's not an incredibly strong muscle, but it's able to get that motion started, and then the uh, lateral fibers of the deltoid will take over for most of that. The infraspinatus below the spine and then the teres minor are going to be laterally rotating the arm. And then the subscapularis is going to be the medial rotator. 
You'll also note that every one of these four rotator cuff muscles is inserting into either the greater tubercle or the lesser tubercle of the humerus. The subscapularis here off by itself is inserting into that lesser tubercle, while all three of these on the posterior side, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor are all inserting into the greater tubercle. So let's move on to part C, the elbow. Uh, anatomical names of those articulations. When we say elbow, we really mean two different articulations, the humeroulnar joint and the humeroradial joint, both of which are synovial hinges. There are five muscles that help to flex the elbow, and those are going to be located mostly on the anterior side of the arm, while the elbow extenders, uh, four muscles that extend the elbow, and those are going to be in the posterior part of the arm. So let's look at those flexors. If we look at the anterior part of the upper arm, we're going to find most superficially the two biceps brachii muscles. Uh, the biceps brachii short head that originates from the coracoid process, and then the biceps brachii long head, which actually crosses the glenohumeral joint because it originates at the supraglenoid tubercle. However, even though this muscle does cross the glenohumeral joint, it does not really contribute any substantial amount to uh, any movement at that joint. If we were to look underneath those two muscles, we would be able to see the brachialis muscle and then also the coracobrachialis. And I've bolded that brachialis because that is the muscle that is going to be the primary agonist of this action. Here, if we look on the right side with this entire arm put together, we can still see those two biceps brachii on there. We can't see the brachialis because it's below that, but now we can see the other two muscles here, the brachioradialis and the pronator teres that are the final two flexors. Muscles that extend the elbow. As we mentioned, these are gonna be located posteriorly, and we have the three triceps muscles, the triceps brachii long head, lateral head, and medial head and then also the anconius, which is a very short muscle that is just posterior to the elbow. Thus far, any times we've talked about a muscle that has a biceps associated with it, there's been a long head and a short head. The triceps have a long head, but there is no short head, so don't get confused on this. There's a long head, then there's a lateral head, and a medial head. And if you were just looking at the most proximal part of this, unfortunately, just to add to the confusion, the two heads that are right next to each other are the long head and the lateral head. To get a really good view of the medial head, you have to go more distally and closer to the elbow. This image here, the superficial one, again, you can see here that long head that's coming from the infraglenoid tubercle. And then you also have here the lateral head that's coming from that posterior proximal humerus. If we were to remove those two heads, then we get a much better view of the medial head that is the deeper of the three muscles. So what about supination and pronation? So the ones that allow movement um, at those distal and proximal radial ulnar joints. Supination is facilitated by both heads of the biceps brachii and then also the supinator muscle, which is a deep muscle that um, is going to be covered in most of the models and charts that we're looking at. The pronation is going to be facilitated by the pronator teres, which you can see right here. And we've already mentioned the pronator teres once because it's also an elbow flexor. And it also the pronator quadratus, which is going to be located at the distal part of the arm. So notice that while the pronator teres and the biceps brachii both function as elbow flexors, pronator teres pronates and the biceps brachii supinates. And now onto the muscles that are flexing the wrist and the digits. So recall that the anatomical name for the wrist is the radiocarpal joint. And if we wanna identify these muscles, we wanna be looking at the anterior side of the lower arm. And we wanna start by finding the pronator teres, which we've already mentioned as an elbow flexor. And the way that you do this is you hold out your right arm. This is kind of the trick for, for finding these muscles and getting them oriented. Hold out your right arm and then take your left arm and put your thumb right around that medial epicondyle so you have four fingers laying across your arm. Those four fingers are meant to represent the approximate locations of the pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus, and the flexor carpi ulnaris. So PF, PF is the way to remember that. Again, you can see those right over here. So we've got our pronator teres, 
which is only flexing the elbow. It's not doing anything to the wrist or the digits, but this is kind of the beginning of the landmark here. So if we start heading around to the medial side from there, we've got pronator teres and then the flexor carpi radialis. Flexor carpi is saying, telling you that it flexes the wrist. Radialis is meaning to say that it is going and inserting on the radial side. So because it is a radialis muscle, that also implies that it is going to help abduct the wrist. After that is the palmaris longus, which is coming all the way down and inserting into the palmar aponeurosis. And then the flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor carpi, again, is letting you know that it flexes the wrist. Um, the ulnaris part of it is telling you it inserts on the ulnar side of the arm, and therefore it is an adductor of the wrist. If we take a look at the deep muscles here, if we remove some of these superficial ones, we can also see the flexor digitorum superficialis. And this is a muscle that is not going to in, um, contribute to any abduction or adduction, but it still is going to flex the wrist in the and the fingers because it's inserting into the base of the uh, middle phalanges. Deep to this is where you're going to find the flexor digitorum profundus, that this is not one that you're responsible for. But if you see that there's one called superficialis, that probably is implying that there is a profundus that's going to be even deeper to that. So those are the flexors of the wrists. What about the extensors? Let's move around to the other side. And if you recall, we left off on our way wrapping around the arm at the flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor carpi ulnaris was on the ulnaris side again, so that meant that it was an adductor. Flexor carpi flexing the wrist. Right next to the flexor carpi ulnaris is going to be the extensor carpi ulnaris. It still has the ulnaris in it. That's telling you that it is on the ulnar side and an adductor, but this time it is an extensor carpi, so it is extending the wrist. As we continue around from the extensor carpi ulnaris, we're going to get to two muscles. If we're closer to the elbow, it's going to look like we're going straight to the extensor digitorum. But if we peek in between the two of them, we're going to see another smaller muscle that is the extensor digiti minimi. Extensor digiti minimi is um, a muscle that is going to help extend the little finger. So that's hence the name. Uh, extensor digitorum is going to extend digits two through five. And in addition to extending the digits, those are also wrist extensors. Once we get past the extensor digitorum, we're going to actually come across two extensor carpi radialis muscles. There's an extensor carpi radialis longus and an extensor carpi radialis brevis. This might sound familiar to you because think back to the lower limb, we were looking at a fibularis longus and brevis. What side of the leg were the fibularis muscles on? They were on the lateral side. From an anatomical position, what side of the arm are these extensor carpi radialis muscles located? On the lateral side, so we're seeing a pattern here. So there's a longus and a brevis, and the longus, just as before, is sitting more superficial to the brevis. As you come down here to the more distal end of the arm, you're going to find these two muscles that work just on the thumb. You are not responsible for those muscles, but I think those muscles make a really good landmark for you. Because if you're close to the wrist, you can see how all of these tendons are passing underneath this extensor retinaculum. And so you're going to see the tendon of the extensor carpi ulnaris, and then the extensor digiti minimi, and then the extensor digitorum. And then to confirm that you are at the boundary between those extensors and then the carpi radialis ones, you're going to see these two muscles, those wrapping around, and those are covering the tendons of the extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus. So that's why you can't see those tendons kind of following along the line here. I think it's even more obvious if you look at this cadaver image. So you can see that extensor digitorum, and then notice how if we head um, just a little bit more laterally there, we don't see any other tendons here, but we do see those two uh, thumb muscles. And then that's when we're gonna be able to see the extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and then the brachioradialis. Jumping back for a second, that brachioradialis is the other large muscle that's going to be on that anterior part of the arm. You've already been introduced to the brachioradialis when we were talking about elbow flexion. And although it's in line here with all of these other muscles that are flexing the wrist, I want to point out that the insertion of this 
muscle is on the radius itself. It's on the styloid process of the radius, so it doesn't even cross the wrist. So therefore, the brachioradialis can't do anything to the wrist. It's really the main muscle of the forearm that, ha that contributes quite a lot to the, the space. It takes up a good deal of space on that forearm, but isn't actually doing anything to the wrist. All right, so here's just a quick little summary of the different muscle actions at the wrist and hand. So our three muscles that are involved in hand abduction, notice that all of them have radialis on there. Radialis is the lateral muscle. If something's heading lateral, it's being abducted. We have two muscles that are hand adductors, and both of those are the ulnaris muscles. If we are extending the wrist, we're going to have all of the extensor muscles. All of them have extensor in them. Extensor digitorum, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and extensor carpi ulnaris. Wrist flexion, all of them have flexor in them. Flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus, and the palmaris longus. So that is the only one that does the wrist flexion that it um, does not actually have the word flexor in it. I do want to point out, though, that the palmaris longus is a muscle that actually not everybody even has. The, um, you can just do a little Google search if you want to see a test that you can do to see if you actually have this muscle because uh, it contributes very little to the wrist flexion. And so there have been some cases where this muscle has ceased to be functional and just due to a lack of any selective pressure on it, it has just disappeared in some people. So that's the conclusion of our very brief tour of the muscles of the upper limb. Once again, I would recommend going back and making sure that you're very comfortable with that activity and coloring in all of the muscles based on where their actions are and really think about what patterns you're noticing in, um, in terms of where the muscles are located relative to their actions. And in addition, that activity you'll notice also has several other kind of tag-along uh, tag questions asking you to identify some articulation. So that's a, a good way to kind of tie that back in and make, sure, and make sure that you're not forgetting that information as we're moving on from articulation to muscles.